Oh, it's just draining out my nose. Is that normal? Is that ha ha? Hey, what's going on, everybody? For First We Feast, I'm Sean Evans, and you're watching Hot Ones. It's the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. And today we welcome Drew Barrymore to the hot seat. She's the Golden Globe award-winning actress you know from films like The Wedding Singer, E.T., Charlie's Angels, and many more. These days you can catch her on Netflix's Santa Clarita Diet and hosting The Drew Barrymore Show, which is set to premiere on CBS September 14th. Drew Barrymore, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Before we get started, I want to compliment your team. The way you guys have recreated the Hot Ones experience right down to the red napkins. I just want to say I'm humbled. I'm blown away looking at it. Well, first of all, you deserve nothing less, um, as does the show. And uh, I know that if I'm watching it, I want to be in that environment. So let's be transportive and take people with us. What's this on the Scoville scale? Nice and easy, like 1800 Scoville, like very much sort of the table sauce. Yeah. I know I'm gonna be fine for a while and then not. <laughs> <laughs> So recently you teased the premiere of the Drew Barrymore show by interviewing Kenan Thompson and Kel Mitchell, the two stars of the cult classic film, Good Burger. The three of you share in common the unique experience of navigating big screen Hollywood as kids. Do you feel a kinship towards those particular actors who've gone down that road and come out the other side? I was talking to um, my daughters and their cousins. I had like a clown car of kids this weekend. And we were talking about a lot of these people who grow up in the industry. And I said, you know, the thing that you have to realize is how hard it is to grow up at all, let alone in front of everybody. People who can create longevity from being a kid into going an adult while doing it with no boundaries, it's an art. But anyone who can figure out how to navigate it no matter what that journey looks like, if at some point they grow into themselves and there is any form of grace there, it's, it's a big kudos. These uh, wings are delicious, by the way. I can get down with a mock chicken any day. This is good. So you've been acting since you were 11 months old and over the years have appeared in more than 70 TV shows and movies. So here, what we want to do is just fact check some of the folklore surrounding your biggest roles. Fact or fiction, you were supposed to be the main lead in Scream, but fought to take a character who was killed in the first 12 minutes as a way to kind of like goof on the audience. Okay, so in the horror film genre, my biggest pet peeve was that I always knew the main character was gonna be like slugging through at the end, but was gonna like creak by and make it. And that's the art of great filmmaking that even if you know that you're still like, oh, oh God. What I wanted to do is to take that comfort zone away. So I asked if I could be Casey um, Becker so that we would establish that that rule does not apply in this film. Fact or fiction, in the lead up to Charlie's Angels, you, Cameron Diaz, and Lucy Liu had to do a 40 mile survival hike as part of the training? Ugh, I mean, I literally almost lost my two dearest friends. Um, for the press tour, Marie Claire Magazine was like, I know, can we send you to Outward Bound for three days? And of course the producer side of me was like, yeah, 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 that's a great idea, that's fresh, that's different. We just got set out in the middle of nowhere, no blankets, no food, three days in. I lost my mind. And my girlfriends were like, we don't even want to talk to you right now. And I just slumped in a corner and I came back around at the end and they kindly received me, but I got put out like Dino at the end of Flintstones. 
Is it true that your grandfather's body was stolen from the morgue by W.C. Fields, Errol Flynn, and Sadakachi Hartman so that they could prop him up against a poker table and throw one last party with the guy? Not only yes, uh, but there have been like cinematic interpretations of that. Um, a Blake Edwards film called SOB that's just brilliant and fun to watch no matter what. And then I've heard things about Weekend at Bernie's. I can't know ever if that's even true, but yes, they did. And I will say this, I hope my friends do the same for me. That is the kind <laughs> of spirit I can get behind. Just prop the old bag up. Let's have a few last rounds and I think death comes with so much morose sadness, and I understand that, but if it's okay, just for me, if everybody could be really happy and celebratory and have a party, that would be my preference. Mm, I love the taste of this one. The Scoville scale in my mouth, Wilbur Scoville, 1912, zero, right here. Fine. So it wouldn't be a First We Feast production if we didn't get extremely granular about your food preferences. When you think back on all the movies that you've done, which one had the best craft service? Home fries? No, ironically. It was the two Charlie's Angels movies. And the reason I say that, and Santa Clarita Diet because my favorite craft services are the ones that have the little mini sandwich making area. And you just have a little stack of bread and some lettuce and some pre-cut tomatoes and some sliced cheese. Give me a sandwich bar any day and I'm just so happy. And then on Santa Clarita diet, you know, you're like a zombie eating just like what looks like gray meats and stuff. Does that food taste disgusting? Is it good? What is that? So one time it was the, a raw chicken leg and it was cake when I bit into it. So it really kept it interesting. I never knew what I was gonna get because they were always trying to like hit some mark. Because I don't think I'm a good actor. I like the genuine moments and Sheila delighted in the human meat so much that it made my job so real because I always was having so much fun with it. Oh God, I love Sheila Hammond so much. She brought me back to life in so many ways. Ooh, all right. I'm, I just felt such tremendous relief and I just realized in that moment, oh, there's, there's where I'm an idiot. I've used this analogy before, but sometimes like professional wrestlers, they get cocky and then they get the chair smashed over their heads, you know? The chair's coming. <laughs> so we interview actors all the time, but it's rare to talk to somebody with their hands in as many honey pots as you have, from the producing and directing credits to, of course, your production company alongside Nancy Juvenin. When you think about the fundamental ways that movies have changed over the years, what are some of the things that stand out? You know, I know E.T., for example, was a movie that was shot in sequence, but that's kind of a thing of the past. That was... Again, Steven just is the greatest genius. There is nothing more irritating. Actually, that's a hyperbolic statement that doesn't apply to this world at all. It's difficult and challenging when you care very much about your job and you wanna do a good job. Life is a journey and we just don't know things until we know things and a lot of the time films will shoot the last scene of the movie right up front because of budgetary reasons. Shooting in sequence was the greatest luxury with E.T. and it's just not really a realistic thing in the industry. But I do think the biggest change in the industry is the amount of movies that come out, the type of movies that can survive at a box office now are not the same type of movies that used to come out, mostly comedies, romantic comedies. You really have to have the expectations of like tentpole comic book movies, but there's so much great storytelling now. So as long as it's rich in that, then bring it on and put it anywhere and everybody comes to play because what we all want watching it is relatability, entertainment, escapism, education, something to fall into. So if it's good, I don't really care where it is. I just want to get lost in it. 
Oh, the grandma's coming. I mean, I'm not chintzing here either. Very impressed from this side of the Zoom. Um, I didn't want to be a pussy and just like, you know. All right, Drew, we have a recurring segment on our show called Explain That Gram, where we do a deep dive on our guest's Instagram, pull interesting pictures that need more context. What do you remember about presenting an E.T. doll to Princess Diana? I remember it so well. I actually have a series of pictures from this, and you can see Steven in that picture watching me like a hawk, and I didn't have a dad, you know, growing up, so he really was that father figure for me, and I just latched right on like koala, the eucalyptus tree. And he was explaining, like, make sure you present the doll to her. There was a curtsy, and I just, for a seven-year-old little girl to be meeting not only a princess, but Princess Diana, it's like living in a fantasy. Where does rushing the field at Fenway Park in front of a sold out crowd rank amongst maybe the wildest scenes that you've ever had to shoot for movies? Another fantasy. I also had to drop down from the green monster and I slipped and I smashed my disc. Uh, so I wasn't very comfortable, uh, but I mean, you know, hey, give a disc for Fenway any day but the Red Sox started winning. It just was this wild moment that we got to experience in history and keep filming right there on the field, including the winning game. It was like a front row seat to history. You've done three box office shattering rom-coms with Adam Sandler. How early on did you recognize your unique chemistry? I just, I wanted to be a pair. I loved what he'd put out in the world. There aren't a ton of men who have this sort of clean cut, good person thing that guys are really into and girls love and they're just awesome comedians and their humor isn't mean spirited or overly dirty, but it's not like so clean and sanitized. He hit every mark for me. And I thought if I could get on a magic carpet with this gentleman, I'm convinced we could go places I just have this admiration and adoration, and I pretend it's an in love thing, but it's really just a love thing. And I have it with him and for him, and so I thought, can we do something with this? I can't like sit on this anymore. I love you. The Reaper. Very smoky. You can taste like the, the burnt chili in that one, as Action Bronson would say. I am starting to schwitz a little bit. Like it's coming out the pores. You're a member of Saturday Night Live's exclusive five-timer club and hold the title as the youngest person ever to host, doing a show alongside the likes of Eddie Murphy and a young Julia Louis-Dreyfus when you were just seven years old. Saturday Night Live is a very big training ground for me. It's just a really like 360 kind of experience and they're changing the dialogue on you at the last second. Um, I don't like to look at the cue cards. I like to try and memorize everything so that if something goes wrong and it's live that I'm not using a crutch, but they're changing stuff on you to the last minute and it gets so challenging. That's fear. Saturday Night Live is terrifying. And I love it because when you're afraid, it means you haven't done it before, you're not confident, and you are in this zone. And that's where I prefer to be. As sick and masochistic as it is, I love it. I, I have to admit, I was worried what if I couldn't make it through. And by the way, I don't know why I'm saying that now. Oh, that was it. I just did it. I just screwed myself. I think you'll be fine, but you know, overall, I think I see, you know, people come into the show and, and, and there is like a natural sort of nervousness that happens with guests, you know, because you're really kind of stuck on the show with me in front of all these like scorching hot sauces and wings. And then you got cameras on you, like you can't escape. Like once you do someone's show, you can't escape. You're like, you're tethered here, you're stuck. How awesome is it that you found a format to make people nervous? squeal with delight, want to come on and test themselves, be a part of this party you've started. 
I'm, that is no easy feat. Hottest one so far. It's really interesting. It's where I seem to be experiencing the most side effects of this is just out my skin. Yeah, it can kind of squeeze you like a sponge. I've, I've said that before. You can kind of like sweat in places you didn't know you had. Yeah, it's all here. But be careful around there, you know? Yes, I know, I keep touching it. Gosh, I know better. I've heard you say that you have special admiration for entertainers who are chameleon-like in their appearance. As someone who was once the face of CoverGirl, who are the people that stand out to you as trailblazers from a presentation perspective? I, uh, I, I, <laughs> okay. I, I love when Madonna, Lady Gaga, Barbra Streisand, David Bowie, people would come out and I never knew what they were gonna look like that time. And I would wait with great anticipation at what their next act was. But like when Lady Gaga came out as a guy at the Grammys, I just fell over. I was like, yes, this is the type of thing I am craving and I'm looking for. It was the most unexpected thing for her to do. And this is a woman who came out in meat dresses. Um, and inside of bizarre eggs with, you know, Roman soldiers carrying her. But it's not shock for shock's sake. It's all them and it's all there and it unfurls and unveils for you like great art. Why the red napkins, may I ask? I think we just pulled them out of a shelf and then we've just been going with red ever since. But when we started the show, Drew, we did not think these th things out all the way. We were not like, oh, color scheme, like palette, like, we were just uh, just popping this thing up and trying to make it happen. Well, I'm so glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> I feel really stupid because I thought that maybe, just maybe, that I was going to be different. <laughs> uh, I'm not. Hot sauce has a way of humbling you, especially this one. You know, my daughter, actually, Olive, gave me some tips, actually. <laughs> what are some of the tips? She said, never stop chewing and fast, be fast. Smart girl. Um, I also noticed that it seems like people make a mistake by licking their lips, so I'm trying not to do that. <sighs> so I understand that you have an endless appetite for classic novels and credit reading for inspiring your return to Hollywood after what you call an unemployable hiatus. Do you have a favorite literary Easter egg from one of your films? I read that the rabbit in Donnie Darko was inspired by the rabbits in that English novel Watership Down. That's a Richard Kelly thing. Um, my literary Easter egg was reading Still Life with Woodpecker by Tom Robbins in 51st Dates because Lucy reads the same book every day. And I, I love that book. What's one Stephen King book and one Stephen King movie everyone should watch during quarantine? Stand by me. Oh my God. Woo. Oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, it's just draining out my nose. Is that normal? Is that how? Totally normal. Totally normal, Drew. I'm right here with you. I'm right here with you. Scarlett said it's like giving birth, but I had C-section, so I I couldn't relate. As queen of the rom-com, which novel would you pull off the shelf for a hopeless romantic? A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway. Be honest, which piece of classic literature is the most overrated? Moby Dick? 
I'm having a hard time processing. Uh, never made it through Moby Dick. And also I'm like hesitant to crap on a literary masterpiece. <laughs> Ooh. I'm dizzy. Is that that's normal, right? Uh. <laughs> How you feeling? You want to move on? You want to chill for a sec? Yeah. It's down. It's over. What's the backstory of appearing in SZA's music video for Drew Barrymore? It's kind of the perfect cameo. Well, first I went through like a social media cha channel, which everybody would do like, I, I don't know, like, hi, SZA, it's me. I love you. And uh, if I can ever do anything uh, one day that would please you or make you happy, will you let me know? And then she invited me to come do the music video and I showed up and I did. I asked her, why did you name the song with my name, may I ask? I'm not in the lyrics. What was it that became the moniker for it? And she really talked about that it was a feeling and something she related to and a feeling she had associated with me. That was why she wanted to name the song that. It's a real honor to be on anyone's radar that you respect, period. It's, uh, everything is changing. <sighs> well, hold on, Drew. We're almost at the finish line. Yes, Sean. All right, Drew Barrymore, this is the last dab. We call it the last dab because it's tradition around here to put a little extra yep. on the last wing. A little redundant here in these quarantine episodes since everybody's just dumping sauce all over wings, but here we are. And what a journey it's been, um, Drew. It's been, it's been lovely spending the afternoon with you, I have to say. Sean, I honestly, I am having a surreal moment that I would ever be on your and your colleagues radar because I, oh. The sauce and talk, it's, it's tougher than it looks, you know? This is definitely the don't be a puss moment. Very strong. All right, Drew Barrymore, here we are at the end of our spicy food adventure and we've touched on your many interests in films, but to close things out, I wanna talk about one thing and one thing only, and that is whales. If you ask me, the most underrated project on your storied resume is Big Miracle, a film about rescuing whales in the Arctic Circle. So now, with your brain on fire, your tongue ablaze, what do you find most special about whales? The barnacles on whales is what I love because human beings have scars and marks and life upon them. And when I see those barnacles on those whales, it reminds me of wrinkles and life and how beautiful it is to have these badges all over your body of life. Well, you know what, Drew Barrymore? The barnacles, they may stick to us. The hot sauce, it may challenge us. But at the end of the day, we just keep moving. We just keep going. We just keep swimming. And look at you, Drew Barrymore, taking on some of the hottest vegan wings in the history of the world. And now there's nothing left to do but roll out the red carpet for you. This camera, or this camera, let the people know what you have going on in your life. I'm so honored to say here on The Hot Ones with Sean, that I uh, am lucky enough to be doing a show. Yes, it's called The Drew Barrymore Show, but it's a show. And I want to have it be a celebration of life and explore and examine all of it and have comedy. And I'm really excited for this opportunity. So I guess that's what I came to plug, but I really came here to play. Thank you, thank you for having me. Great job, Drew, great job. On top of Mount Scoville, 
Drew flexing it out. Not Wilbur Scoville in 1912. <laughs> uh.